my name is Carl Sutherland, and I'm a software engineer at Acuity Scheduling, where I build and support our public API. Uh, for the context of my talk, QED Scheduling is an online appointment scheduling software for small businesses, allowing businesses to uh, let their clients book online. So businesses can set up uh, appointment types. These are services and configure pricing and duration of services. They can also offer those services via calendars. Typically, a calendar represents an employee or a business location. Calendars are configured with availability and various uh, restrictions and constraints on, on scheduling. So today, I'll be talking about APIs for humans and the humans that use them. APIs make it possible for machines and systems to communicate with each other. But even in our increasingly automated world, those dots are initially connected by humans still, often developers like us. And human-friendly APIs are an important part of developer experience. Today, I'll cover some tips for improving developer experience by using logs, documentation, and the API itself. So who's heard of developer experience before? Good. So developer experience, similar to user experience, it focuses on the developer's interaction with your platform, whether that's positive or negative. In the context of APIs, good developer experience means good API design, good documentation, and good technical support. Good API design means meeting developer expectations for their environment. So data in the right format, consistent endpoint argument and attribute names, helpful error messages that are human readable. Good documentation includes documentation for the API itself, but also providing examples in languages that your audience is using, guides for specific or non-trivial use cases, and helpful error messages, which maybe explain a common pitfall or problem that somebody's having and the solution to it. Good technical support means fast, accurate, and human. So knowledgeable answers provided quickly from a person. So we all know a little bit about developer experience now. If you'd like to learn more, I've got some links at the end of my deck. Diving in. So who are these humans using our APIs? All of this kind of starts with good logs. Using logs, we can watch developers interacting with the API and learn about their business, how they're using the API, what they use it for, and a little bit of what they're struggling with. Similar to user experience, we gain insight into the experience of the developer and the API itself, allowing us to iteratively improve our developer experience. So again, it starts with logs. At Acuity, we use New Relic. Is anybody else using New Relic out there? So I'm not here to plug New Relic. It's just what we use. Um, the important thing is that you log the right data and that you can then access that data, search it, filter it, retrieve it in a meaningful way. So at Acuity, we log every transaction. That includes all the important details, such as the HTTP method, the route they're accessing, sometimes the entire URI, um, the response code, and any error codes that were generated along with the request. And anonymous IDs related to the request, sometimes uh, query parameters as well. Here's what this looks like. So this is kind of the, uh, the fire hose. This is every request that comes through and what it looks like. We've got all the information we're looking for here, HTTP response code, the route that they're accessing. Um, I've also got access to some of those anonymous IDs. And right away, we can dive in and start to learn a little bit more about our actual users. So here is a uh, query for the total number of users accessing our API in the past 30 minutes. It's 3,000 some businesses. Most of those correspond to unique business. Um, from there, we can start to see a little bit about what they're doing. Uh, I've grouped this query by 
route, and we can see the number of transactions. So most people are accessing their appointment data. Generally, this is just getting data out of Acuity. Maybe they're using some automation to sync it to another system. Some of it will be creating appointments. And then next, people are accessing their account metadata, those appointment types, the services their business is providing, and the calendars that have availability for those services. There's a lot of other stuff here. Availability endpoints down at the bottom, getting available dates and times. So from there, we can start to dig into um, actual problems, hot spots in our API that we might want to uh, improve here. So I'm just searching for anybody generating a 400 response. And there we start to see some of the errors that people are having. A lot of these are generated by automated integrations with our API. So required first name would be an error generated by a client not submitting their first name while, while booking. Payment error, again, that's uh, typically on the client side, maybe an incorrect uh, credit card number or expiration date. And finally, um, we can narrow in on specific users. Now, this is just this is my account here. Um, and I've got some automation running in the background, periodically pulling my appointments and syncing them to, uh, to some other, other systems here. All right. So this is a lot of data. And from this data, how do we figure out who the humans are? If we can narrow in on these humans, we can gain that important insight that we're looking for about the developer experience and, and start to iterate to improve things. So we do this in a couple ways. The first thing is new users interacting with our API. If a new account accesses the API for the first time, it's often done by a developer, somebody poking around, checking out our, our capabilities. New features are another thing. Anytime we release a new endpoint or API option, the initial calls and usage of that option will be made by a developer. Machines don't yet discover this um, on their own. So that's a, that's a sure bet. And then users who are asking for support. If a developer writes in with a specific question about our API or mentions an error message or is having a problem, we can query our logs and, and usually suss out which requests were from, from that developer. Now, helpful with all of this is the user agent. That's uh, like the agent string that is accessed in the API, maybe a browser or Postman or something like that, that is a, a developer tool humans use to interact with the API, and that's a, that's a good hint. All right, so here's some of what we found while watching users use our API, starting with, uh, starting with new users and then API features and uh, developers who, who actually write into support. So new users. Acuity's API development has always been very iterative, and most of the changes we make have a specific user in mind. In the early days of our API, all the way in the beginning, we would watch every new API user and see how they're interacting with the system, what their business is like, their use cases, and importantly, the, the problems that they're having. So here's a very early user of our API. And a little bit of what they're doing. So this person, right away, the first thing they try to do is create a new appointment type. Or create a new appointment, sorry. Um, they get an error message, invalid appointment type. Come back, maybe find an appointment type ID in their account somewhere. Get a no available calendar. And they start to search for available dates. They have a required appointment type ID error, which means they just did not support, uh, submit the appointment type ID. They correct that by adding 123 there. They had a valid ID when they were creating the appointment, but here they, here they did not use one. They get a forbidden error that belongs to someone else. Then they get an invalid calendar error. This is similar to the invalid appointment type they got initially. So they're struggling here to get availability. They generate an invalid month error. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. And uh, now they're finally having success. They get a 200, and they have available dates for the particular appointment type and calendar they're looking for. So they take that back to the post-appointment endpoint. They're trying to create an appointment, and they still get no available calendar. 
Uh, this basically means Acuity is not able to find a, a calendar with availability for the time they're, they're submitting. They try to use the same calendar ID they were searching for dates from. Um, they appended to the query string. That's not where we want it. This is a post endpoint. And it should be submitted with the, the post body here. So they do that, and now they're just getting a not available error message. It's been about 10 minutes. Um, they 15 minutes. They get frustrated here. They just start hammering away, post, post, post. <laughs> they're getting a ton of uh, different availability errors, either not available slot or uh, min hours in advance. That's related to the scheduling limits and restrictions they've set up on the, on the calendar they're trying to use here. They hammer away for about another 10 minutes. And down here, uh, Probably after investigating our docs again a little bit, they go back to the available dates endpoint, find the available times endpoint, which actually returns the, the individual slots that are available on a date, and immediately use that one correctly. Now, that takes pretty much the same arguments as the dates endpoint, so they've been through this once. They'll uh, just submit pretty much the same stuff, including the date return from the previous call here, and uh, they're, they're good to go. So after about 30 minutes down at the bottom here, they get an invalid fields error that's easy to solve, and finally post the, the correct appointment type. They've, after 30 minutes, created an appointment using our API. So we're an online scheduling company, and booking appointments is obviously a, a primary use case for our, our API. It's also not totally trivial. There's lots of metadata about the account. You need to select a calendar, an appointment type, and you need to find the available dates and times for it. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong with this availability and the different account settings and configuration that you've got. So over time, we've given this common and tricky use case a uh, very special treatment in our documentation and developer resources. We provide guides and uh, examples in various flavors. And it's helpful to uh, give the developer access to this information right in the API itself. So if you make a request to a particular endpoint and have a guide for it, you can return that in error messages to the, to the developer. Likewise, with new features. Anytime we add a feature to our API or an API option, we've got a particular user in mind for it. We'll reach out to them personally and let them know that things are ready. And then we'll wait and we'll watch our, watch our logs here. So here's a request we received. Um, this user, she was just looking for historical data for their, for their classes that were offered previously in Acuity. Now, it's not something that we had documented in our public API, but this was actually something we'd added just a couple weeks before she requested this. Um, we added it for our mobile application, which is also powered by our public API. And I was able to send her a message saying, hey, here's, a, here's some documentation for the classes endpoint. And here's an example of the new option. So I set a timer for myself, just a little reminder, to the next day uh, check in on them and see how it's going. And I check the logs, and uh, I see that they switched just a little bit after they got that email from me. They switched from using the uh, per month option to not using that, and using the new include unavailable option. So that returns all their classes, both uh, past and present, and uh, it got them the, the data that they wanted. There was a 200 response with this request, and they had, they had no trouble at all. So they're happy. I don't need to follow up with them, and I can add this to our public documentation, and people find it in the future. So with all this watching, we've paid particularly close attention to errors generated by developers using the API for the first time. From the beginning, we started noticing patterns. I mentioned that month invalid date, invalid month um, option in the, in the new user example. Right from the start, we had a lot of problems with, uh, with date time formats. Now, we, we accept a, a variety of formats. Right in our documentation, it says that any representation of a month parsable by PHP string to time will work. I don't know how people keep screwing this up, but they do. And for users who had trouble with this, we, uh, we ended up adding example date times and example months in this case right to, the, right to the error response here. So this is what we would see before. We have a 
request to our API that generated an invalid month response. A couple minutes later, probably after consulting our documentation, they come back with the correct format. Immediately after we implemented this error code, new users of the, users of the API hitting invalid date and time formats, no matter what they're submitting, receive the correct one in the response, and just a couple seconds later, they're able to submit the, the proper format to the, to the API there. Here's another example. Does anybody see what's wrong with this request? Typo, yes. So early on in the development of our API, I noticed a pattern with 404 error message, messages. We are an online scheduling company. And what I noticed was that people can't spell calendar. People also can't spell the word availability. And myself included, I typo these all the time. So to combat illiteracy, we implemented a more helpful 404 error messages. And today it looks like, looks like this. Did you mean calendars spelled correctly with an A? Um, to do this, we, uh, it's, it's pretty simple. We take the URI that they're submitting, and we compare it to our list of uh, existing routes or known routes using a string distance metric. And whatever matches within some reasonable tolerance, um, we'll suggest that to them as, as perhaps the spelling that they're looking for here. Again, just uh, an anecdote of how this improved things. Uh, this user got calendars wrong here and uh, received our helpful 404 message response and was able to correct that in just a few seconds. So proactive support. As we watch our API logs, and especially with new features, we reach out to users we haven't been in touch with before that are having, that are having trouble. We can also use our logs to be more helpful when users reach out to us first. Here's the uh, best case scenario of that. So this is a user, John, who receives the 403 forbidden error message and wrote into support about it. This is a similar error message to the appointment type error we saw with a new user earlier on. So I got this email and didn't, wasn't able to read it for a couple hours. I pulled up our logs for the account, and I see that they did indeed generate that 403 forbidden error. But they kept going. They got some other errors related to configuration of their account. And in the, in the end here, we have, a, we have a happy conclusion. They were able to uh, resolve the configuration error, submit the correct ID, this ID was uh, for an appointment that did not belong to them, and get a 200 response. So instead of uh, replying and asking them for more information or, or what it is they're submitting to our API, an example request or something like that, I can simply reply, congratulations. It looks like you found exactly what you're looking for. And if you have any future trouble, just, uh, just reach out and let us, let us know here. All right, so that's what I've got to uh, wrap up here. I'd just like to say, um, actively use your, your API logs. Learn about what your developers are doing and how they're interacting with your platform, what they struggle with, and use that knowledge to, to improve your, your API. Um, to tie this all in with, with scaling, I guess, is doing this will, will help you onboard developers faster and with, with less support effort on your end. So you'll be able to scale your support along with your API here. Thank you.